Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Story number one, Dead Languages, written by Sasanic. Elven languages were difficult and required immense dexterity of both the vocal cords and tongue to achieve the most basic sentences. It took an elf youngster, on average, 16 human years to speak their tongue competently. And it took thrice as long to be on the higher vocabulary level akin to that of a scholar, or even a philosopher. And such elven language, considered an ancient and dead language for millennia, was a pivotal in the various elven communities. It had no official name, having deferred between those who spoke it over the course of time. It was considered one of the hardest languages to speak, but the benefits dwarfed the efforts required to master it. It had magical properties that bestowed the speaker with the abilities of healing, or of destruction, or of whatever the speaker wished. Rare as it was, the elves had taken responsibility for such power and had vowed never to use it for anything other than the betterment of the elven race. Every race had their own dead languages, of course. Each race had tried to show the benefits of their dead languages, but after an aspiring human scholar had tried to recite a basic sentence in his race's dead language, he had inadvertently made himself combust into a shower of boiling blood and scorched flesh. From that day forth, humans were forbidden, by threat of removal of their tongue, or in extreme circumstances, death, by the Council of Magi to utter a single word in their dead language, unless authorized by the Council themselves, which was not a single word. The High Priest Alabiron had been one of the greatest elves to have ever mastered the elven dead language. He had a comfortable position at the council, and was sent to assist the elven forces as they held back an orc assault on a local city. However, the defenders had underestimated the Green Menace, and the attack had been more organized than expected. The city stone walled outer ring had been breached, and the defenders caught off guard for the first hour. For the next three days... They howled out in vain for anybody to break the siege and save the beleaguered inhabitants from the last defensive stone-walled ring. Both humans and elves had set aside their differences in their darkest hour and had vowed to stand side by side until death, if need be. Alabiron had spent his time tending to the wounded, using the dead language to assist with healing. But of course, what gives must also take. It had taken a toll on him, Emaciated and withered, his once strong stride was now weak and bumble. I cannot do this for much longer, he had wheezed to his aides. I will not survive another day of the seeding, he whimpered. We can only hope for a miracle. On the fifth day, that miracle had emerged from the horizon in a flash of light. The first lookout noted the figure on the horizon atop a horse, galloping towards the orc battle camps that lined the city wall breach. The Green Horde had roused quickly at the new arrival, and soon it had whipped itself into a frenzy. The lookouts didn't bother reporting their arrival to anyone. They were sure to die in the first seconds of meeting the Horde. Except, when the rider came within a mere feet of the Horde, a single cry was bellowed as the rider raised a sword to the sky. Morita. A brilliant flash of light blasted out, and a wave ran across the orc swarm. Those closest to the rider were blasted to ash, and those further back were scorched to death. In a mere heartbeat, the initial swarm was reduced to blackened gore. Another cry from the rider echoed out across the eerily silent battlefield. Bagna Prietor me! Instantly, the forms of hundreds of golden soldiers seemingly materialized out of nowhere, all bearing swords and shields. They charged as one into the orc masses, who were both caught between their charging and the new fighters, or were trying to force themselves deeper into the city. Upon hearing the human bellow his dead language, and as a result make a mockery of the elven laws, Alabiron's rage consumed him. He forgot about his weak and frail form and tried to scurry up the fortification stairwell to witness the human breaking magi law. He saw the human rider dismount their horse calmly, letting the golden figure slay and kill with a righteous fervor. The rider looked to Alabiron, the elf scowling from under the hooded cloak. Senatantum, the rider called out, 
and from above the city descended a humanoid form sporting a golden set of wings. One such figure landed atop the battlements, aside Alabiron, and his retinue of guards. One of the guards approached the figure, who took a step to the guard. Instantly, the guard lowered his spear and went slack as the figure reached out. Alabiron made out the figure was a human female, and she was almost as beautiful as an alvin handmaiden. Her eyes were pure white and left a gentle smoke trail when she moved. She was dressed in a light from human armor and accommodated her wings. When she reached out and placed a hand lovingly on the guard's face, he jerked suddenly and fell to his knees with a soft gasp. The woman strode past him and approached Alabiron. Halt! he hissed. Stay back, apparition! He raised a hand in threat to conjure a spell. Still... She approached. The guards went to take up a defensive cordon around their elven leader, but all dropped their weapons one by one and fell to their knees, some weeping gently as the woman passed them. Alabiron backpedaled, tripping on his robes and landing in a heap. The woman stopped at his feet and crouched down. She held out a hand to Alabiron and touched his cheek as she had done with the first guard. Alabiron's eyes widened as he felt the invigorating wave of warmth rush over him. He suddenly forgot about the war, about the orc horde at the battlements, about the dead and dying humans and elves that numbered in the hundreds, about the human rider who spoke the forbidden language. He felt his muscles tighten, and the urge to rise overcame him. He jumped to his feet, looking down at his hands as if he were seeing them for the first time instead of withered and decrepit fingers that he was accustomed to. He saw hands belonging to a man half his age. He was rejuvenated, seemingly inexplicably. How? He simply asked as the woman took a step back, making room for Alabiron's guards to rise. They too seemed to be back at their physical peak that they had once been before the conflict. The language is called Latin, the woman said, her soft voice soothing the to hear. We are the souls of those once fallen, returned to stand alongside the living in their darkest hour. She looked at the battlefield, where the wave of golden warriors had made quick work of the horde and were now amongst the dead and dying human elf defenders, reviving and healing those they could. Alabiron went to speak, and the angelic woman once more, but she was gone. He watched as the golden figures dissipated, and the entrance of the summoner. The crowds gathered around the rider, and all cheered. What do we do about this? one of the guards asked. The human rider has broken Magi law. The human has just saved everyone down there, along with me and you. Alabiron chuckled, a smile across his features, a few bad words in times of war can't hurt anybody. End of story. Story number two. The Human Computer Test, written by Fox Corp. When humanity first began to integrate into the galactic community, they made several strange comments whenever new technologies were implemented. These comments were widespread being uttered by countless thousands of unique individuals. To this day, we haven't gotten a proper answer other than laughter from any human who asks such a thing. The first recorded instance of the phrase was only one day after humanity's uplink to the galactic internet. Popular computing chip manufacturer Texlon Incorporated announced their star power 10,000. It outclassed their previous model by over two times the core speed, with only 10% more power draw. The process was ridiculously advanced for the time, running on a revolutionary 1 nanometer process. Such small processes were thought impossible due to the jumping of transistors, but through and disclosed company advancements, it was achieved. Jump in efficiency and ability led to much online discussion. Much of it was heated debate regarding the competition's ability to counter such a massive leap in performance. Humans, however, seem to have one meaningful addition to this discussion. It was a simple but elusive question. But can it run crisis? The question was small and isolated. It didn't receive widespread attention anywhere other than in the human circles. 
Some commotion was caused, but the phrase faded to obscurity within a matter of days. Until it happened once again, Texbron's competitor, Ringworld Enterprise, managed to surpass the one nanometer process within the year. They reduced the process to a staggering 0.5 nanometer. Even more processing power was attained and power draw was actually reduced. Once again, the humans had one question, but can it run a crisis? This time, the phrase was more widely noticed. Society began to ask what the question meant exactly. Humanity was still a rather new and elusive race. They hadn't made a significant impact on the galactic internet yet. Such a phrase being repeated multiple times demanded some investigation by sociologists within the galaxy. When more research into human technologies was completed, multiple shocked revelations were made. First, humanity already had achieved 0.5 nanometer process. In fact, humanity had surpassed it. However, due to humanity's limited trading partnerships and interstellar connections, they didn't really understand that it was a big deal. Second, humans had combined both quantum and conventional computing with a single CPU. Such processes allowed humans to calculate problems that were extremely difficult for conventional computers to even attempt to answer. They could also effectively store the results. Most shocking of all, the internal human internet was abuzz with news of a project that could finally run crisis. More investigation confirmed the rumors. Humanity was building a megastructure around a red dwarf within one of their systems. When humanity was asked more about both the phrase and the structure, responses were secretive and unclear. Now the galaxy began to ask questions. What is a crisis? Is crisis a hyper-advanced simulation? Is crisis the meaning to life? Only some of our questions will be answered. After 15 years, humanity unveiled its project to the great galaxy, the Matryoshka brain. According to humanity, it was capable of simulating universes, uploading minds, solving entropy, discovering new technologies, figuring out holes within theories of physics, and most importantly, it ran crisis. End of story. I just quickly want to thank the Tier 5 patrons and channel members. Alithia Barkey, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albard and Gaster, Arcadian, Lord Azrakal, and Joachim Backer.